Welcome to today's event, The History of Antisemitism, Blood Libel. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My, now in its 25th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and antisemitism, stories of resistance against injustice, and more. Thank you for joining us today virtually. We hope you will visit the museum in person to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibition, Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust from photographer Martin Scholler, running through June 18th. You can learn more and find tickets on our website. We also appreciate the vital support of our members so much here at the museum. If you want to get closer to the museum and enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions, and free admission, you can explore museum membership on our website or email membership at mjhnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn captions on or off will be posted in the chat in addition to all the links I've mentioned. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Today, we are honored to be joined by Edward G. Berenson, Magda Teeter, Francois Sawyer, and Sarah Lipton. Edward is a professor of history at New York University and NYU's Institute of French Studies. He's a cultural historian specializing in the history of modern France and its empire, with additional interests in the history of Britain, the British Empire, and the United States. His books include The Accusation, Blood Libel in an American Town, The French Republic, History Values Debates, and The Statue of Liberty, A Transatlantic Story. Berenson has won distinguished teaching awards from UCLA and the American Historical Association, and in 2006 was decorated by the French government. Magda Teeter is Professor of History and the Schweidler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University. Uh, she is a fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research and the author of Jews and Heretics in Catholic Poland, Sinners on Trial and Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth. She has been a Harry Starr Fellow in Jewish Studies at Harvard University, an Emmeline Bigelow Conlon Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, also at Harvard University, and the Mellon Foundation Fellow at the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. Francois Sawyer is a senior lecturer in early modern history at the University of New England in Australia, where he has worked since 2018. His research focuses on the history of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic propaganda in early modern Europe in general, and the Iberian world in particular. He is the author of several books, including The Persecution of Jews and Muslims of Portugal, King Manuel I and the End of Religious Tolerance, 1496 to 7, Ambiguous Gender in Early Modern Spain and Portugal, Inquisitors, Doctors and the Transgressions of Gender Norms, and Popularizing Anti-Semitism in Early Modern Spain and its Empire, Francisco de Torrejoncillo and the Centinela Contra Judios, 1674. Sarah is a professor of history at the University of uh, New York at Stony Brook, excuse me. Her research focuses on religious identity and experience, Jewish Christian relations, and art and culture in the high and later Middle Ages or the 11th to 15th centuries. Her books include Dark Mirror, The Medieval Origins of Anti-Jewish Iconography, and Images of Intolerance, The Representation of Jews and Judaism in the, in the Bible Moralise. Lipton is the recipient of several awards, grants, and fellowships, including the Fellowship of the Medieval Academy of America. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. And now I'd like to hand things over to Sarah. Thank you very much, um, Sydney, and welcome to everybody. You have a terrific um, panel in front of you, and I think we should have a very, very interesting discussion. So I'm not going to take up any more time with introductions. My thinking in terms of facilitating these wonderful historians sharing their knowledge is I would start by asking each of them one question and then we will um, have more of a discussion and exchange about the themes that emerge. I'll tell you right now that the one question I'm going to ask each one of them um, very much focuses on the main theme of their scholarly work. And the reason I have to say that is because they also uh, either coincidentally or because we have three prophets in front of us, um, touch upon issues that feel unfortunately very, very current and contemporary. So my questions are really designed to encourage our further discussion to make links between 
the history that these three historians study and the conditions that I think many of us are thinking about today. So I'm going to proceed more or less chronologically and start with Magda. Magda is an early mo modern historian, but her Magdum opus, Blood Libel, goes back to the Middle Ages. Um, and even before I ask my directed question for you, Magda, um, I think it would be very helpful for everybody just to ask the, the first speaker to quickly define blood libel. What is blood libel and what is its relation to ritual murder, which is related but not identical? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, that's a great question. And I think it does need um, explanation because many people confuse the terms. I would say, first of all, we should not use the word ritual murder. Uh, we should use the, the phrase murder libel or child murder libel. And I know mm -hmm. Francois agrees with me on this. Uh, blood libel, uh, both the murder libel and the blood libel as a, as a subset of the murder libel emerged in the Middle Ages. Uh, first as a tale against Jews, uh, accusing them of, um, of killing Christian children in um, reenactment of the crucifixion of Jesus. And then in the 13th century, a blood, mo blood motif was added in which um, it, one of the motivations was that they uh, also they killed also to obtain Christian blood. Uh, and then various variations over time uh, historically took place by the modern period. Some of that um, Christian uh, theological undertone is missing and uh, the stress is on cruelty uh, and enmity of, of Jews. But the short answer is, accusations or labels that Jews killed Christian Christians and especially Christian children. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we might talk about kind of contemporary versions, which uh, definitely transform some of those medieval early modern themes. But for now, uh, the first question I want to ask you, because it's a major theme of your work, which again resonates so much with contemporary circumstances, um, is the role of media in turning lies into perceived fact. Uh, your book is big in many ways. It's, it's, it's physically large, it's long, it covers a lot of territory, it has many different themes, but definitely communication um, and, and evidence and pseudo evidence are major foci. So would you talk to us, what kind of media turn lies into facts and how do they work? Uh, thank you. So at the, at the beginning of the story in the Middle Ages, these were mostly tales. Um, they became facts by being inscribed first in chronicles and in, in other forms of narratives that survived. Um, but they remained rather localized in, in their impact. That is, they spread, and I think many of us, those of us who are familiar and even the public with the idea of blood libel, think about it as a medieval story. But in fact, it becomes an early modern and modern story, much more than a medieval. It does emerge in the medieval period, but it really goes viral, so to speak, to use modern parlance, in the early modern period with the uh, invention of the printing press and the mass communication. Um, and it does so through the uh, reproduction of images, uh, which previously were unknown, or if they existed in local sites, uh, they would have been limited um, in terms of those who would have seen them in access, again, very local um local audience or or visitors um, but with the printing press we suddenly have printed images that get uh transmitted and of course later on they uh, they are added into chronicles and the the important part to your question about turning stories lies and rumors into facts is that they enter authoritative sources so they don't they don't function just in a polemical anti-jewish context but they enter sources of authoritative knowledge, like major, again, chronicles, lives of saints, and things like that, that give weight to these tales that really often are just tales. Um, I don't know whether how much time I have, but when I was struggling with this book is I struggled not to uh, speak of these tales in the way that can be seen as facts. And, and that was a challenge in producing a map, 
that would show you all these dots because these dots are not equivalent. Some things never happen. Some things are just lies and some things do represent actual persecution of Jews. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm sure uh, there's so much more you could say about it and your, and your scholarship, but I think you introduced some ideas that we'll all wanna pick up on later on, which is the reach of a medium, um, how many people can actually see or read it, um, the accessibility pictures, obviously, in a culture where not everybody was literate, um, might have a far wider reach than written text, um, and repetition. So we can maybe all stash that in the back of our minds. Oh, and I would add, I'm very glad you used the word authoritative, because I think we can all talk about the respective damage done when you have one unknown person screaming in an empty field versus maybe, for example, sitting at a dinner table with a person of political power and influence. Thank you very much. Um, next, chronologically and helping us to expand, I think, the relevance and um, broaden the themes associated with the blood libel. Francois, your um, studies of blood libel and murder, child murder accusations, especially in Iberia, um, really focus on, uh, I, I think, bring out two additional dimensions. One of them is the ro role of conspiracism, um, conspiracy theorizing and accusations of, of conspiracies. And the other one is the role of authorities. Um, and Magda was talking about kind of intellectual authorities in terms of publications, but you study the Inquisition. These were people with a commission from the crown in some cases, from the Pope in other cases. So would you share with us some of your insights regarding conspiracism and governmental authority and their role in the blood libel? Mm, yes, thank you, Sarah. And hello, everyone from Australia. To start with your question about conspiracism, I think it is important to consider the blood libel and the child murder accusations as essentially a conspiracy theory. There, this, there's never an accusation that, seeing, that targets an individual Jewish person. Mm -hmm. It always seeks to tar a community. The Jews are always represented as collectively responsible for a heinous crime and therefore, you know, are, so the reasoning goes uh, to be collectively punished. Um, at least that, that's, what, that's what you see in the, in the polemical propaganda that circulates in uh, Spain and in many other parts of Europe. I mean, in Spain is a good example where the Inquisition itself played a big role in the dissemination of the myth. Perhaps the most famous case in Spain, the case of the Holy Child of La Guardia, um, saw the, the Inquisition directly involved in um, essentially putting forth an accusation. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, the case involved the disappearance of the child, then the accusation that a group of Jews, but also Jewish converts to Christianity, had murdered the child in a parody of the crucifixion and were preparing a kind of magical a dark magical ritual that would kill all the Christians of Spain. It's a rather bizarre story. But what gave the story life was that the Inquisition was given responsibility for prosecuting the case. And despite the fact that no one could find any evidence that the child had ever even existed, let alone died, the Inquisition was able to build a narrative that became incredibly powerful and that served its own purposes. Very often we'll see that accusations of child murder and blood libel thrive in a context where there is a, you know, a will to uh, push it forward and sometimes will not thrive if there isn't that will. Um, if the authorities aren't willing to support this, then the accusation will go nowhere. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Could I, I'd like to ask just you to elaborate a little bit more on the conspiracy aspect of it, um, you used a term that I think is essential, a phrase, um, the Jews. And obviously, I mean, a, a part and parcel of any form of bigotry is to generalize and to um, efface all difference within groups and act as if every member of a group had equal responsibility for 
and the same values and actions as the other members of the group. Um, I, I did see on Twitter, someone sort of said, whenever the Jews is trending, you know it's not going to be a good day mm -hmm. um, for Jewish Americans. Um, but in your case, uh, when authorities used the Jews and they, they followed up with actions, um, tell us how they defined their targets. Uh, Jewish communities were, how were they organized? How were they identified? To what extent were members of Jewish communities equally prosecuted and targeted? And how, how were the actual um, judicial murders um, how did they define their victims? Hmm. Well, in the case uh, I've looked at, the Holy Child of La Guardia in Spain in the 1490s, this is an interesting one because essentially you have two groups of people, Jews, and this happens before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, people who are essentially uh, tolerated by the authorities, allowed to live so long as they um, fulfill certain criteria. They live in segregated areas of towns. They theoretically at least have to conform to uh, um, discriminatory laws uh, and they are physically visibly marked. I mean, they have to wear distinctive clothing, clothing, sorry. Alongside them, you have the converts, the conversos, who are perhaps even more feared because they are not distinctly physically visible. You can't distinguish a convert from um, a Christian. And in this case, um, in the case of the Holy Child of La Guardia, for example, there is a conspiracist narrative that clearly ties Jews and converts, Jewish converts to Christianity, who are essentially shown, as, you know, it is, the accusation is, are presented as uh, working together hand in hand. Again, you have this complete, in the narrative, you have the stripping of uh, people's individual identities and then the layering of a just collective guilt. You know, both groups are guilty. Uh, and of course, less than you know, four, trying to think, less than four months after the end of the trial, um, you have the general expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Although, you know, whether there's a distinct link between this uh, accusation and the general expulsion is, is is a moot point, and one still debated amongst historians. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'm just going to put out there that that this further introduces a further theme. I'll ask everyone to speak about a little bit. Um, you mentioned that the visibility of unconverted Jews was rather key to being able to target them. And in my own work, I work on visual representations and visual perceptions of Jews and their appearances. And I will throw out there that this raises the question of disguise, um, because one of the tensions of anti-Semitism is that Jews are somehow or other they should be identifiable, but there's a recognition that they are often not identifiable, but rather than saying, oh, maybe we're wrong, therefore, about the Jews being whatever it is we're saying they are, they're just better at hiding it. Um, but this is something we can discuss. Let me turn now to Ed, um, last in order because of chronology, but by no means least, and at least coming third, Ed, you have the opportunity to respond to the themes that Magda and Francois have brought up, but in your case, I will, of course, have to ask you to tell our um, guests a, a briefly about the much more focused episode of child murder accusation that your book is about. Um, but I will say it's closer in time and place. It's 20th century upstate New York. And this brings in the themes that I would like you to particularly maybe help us understand. Um, one of them is um, the role of ethnicity, of racism, of prejudice, of anti-immigrant sentiment, and how that fed into the ritual murder allegation, if it did, to the extent it did. And then very much related to that is America. Um, Jews in America have for a long time felt safe, equal, undiscriminated against or minimally discriminated against. And um, your book and current events are making some people question that. So um, if you could talk about that as well. So just very briefly, this is an incident that took place in September of 1928, in a little tiny upstate New York town called Messina. A four-year-old girl 
got lost in the woods and there was a huge search for her. She couldn't be found overnight. And during the night of the search, the rumor started to circulate that the Jews of this little town, and there were about a hundred Jewish residents of Messina, the Jews had captured the little girl, her name was Barbara Griffiths, and ritually killed her. But to the point where the next morning, the rabbi of the town was called into the police station and asked a series of accusatory questions about whether Jews engage in ritual human sacrifice. Now, one of the really kind of fascinating and disturbing things about this story is that, of course, the, the, the rabbi, his name was Beryl Brenglass, rejected the accusation, but he rejected it by saying, I can't believe that this is happening in the United States of America. And uh, this was a theme of the members of the, uh, of the Jewish community, all of whom had come from Europe, almost entirely Eastern Europe. And they said, we escaped Europe to the United States because we thought it was safe. And now this hideous, one of the most hideous forms of anti-Jewish hatred has surfaced right here in the United States. And so there was a, a kind of an incredulity about all this. And I, I should add that I was born in this town and my father too. I'm old, but not that old. So of course I was born much <clears throat> long after it happened, but my, my father was a, was, a, was a little boy. And I was able to interview some, some elderly people. This was in, in the late 2000 teens who were old enough to remember this, these, these events. And it was the incredulity, the, the, the idea that this terrible European form of anti-Semitism could surface in, in the United States. And so my, my ta the task I set out for myself in, in the book was try to try to explain how this could happen. Because when you look back into the history of the United States in the 18th and the 19th and even the early 20th century, you don't find examples of this accusation against Jews. There's certainly anti-Semitism, there's prejudice, there's hostility to Jews, there's exclusion of Jews, but this particularly heinous form of hatred of Jewish people doesn't surface in the United States. And this was true even of the infamous Leo Frank case of 1913, in which a Jewish man who was the head of a, of a factory in Atlanta was accused of killing a 14-year-old young woman. And so all the ingredients were there of the, the, the ritual murder accusation that was very similar to a case in Hungary in 1882 where the, there was a 14-year-old young, young, young woman who disappeared and, the, and the, the Jews of the town were accused. The same kind of structural situation took place in, in Atlanta in 1913. And despite all of the anti-Semitic overtones of this case, there was no accusation of ritual murder. And so it's, it seemed to me that the, the idea had to come that is the idea of ritual murder taking place in the United States had to come from the places that gave birth to that idea. And those places tended to be in Europe and uh, interestingly in French speaking Canada, which is just across the border from Messina. Um, thank you. Uh, I believe I saw somebody in the chat asking about the outcome of the case. So if you could quickly um, put people's minds at ease about that. Right, right. So. <laughs> My, my case fortunately differs from all, all, all the others because uh, Barbara uh, got lost in the woods and she spent a long night and, and a good bit of the next day and, she, and she, she wandered out and passing motorists found her. And so it was clear, of course, that there had been no kidnapping and, 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 and no murder and so therefore no trial. And so from a historian's point of view, this is a problem because trials produce a huge amount of records. Uh, 
and so fortunately there was there were there was there was no case but it meant that i had to try to understand how this accusation could surface by looking purely at at contexts, what was going on in the United States in the 1920s that could have made it possible for this basically European form of anti-Semitism to, to surface in, in the United States. Yeah, and that, that's one of the reasons why I asked um, specifically you the question about what is the role of immigration, um, anti-immigrant sentiment, ethnic tension, in your case, and I, I will also expand that because you mentioned French Canada, um, and and just once Ed has answered, I, I'd like to invite Magda and Francois to chime in, and maybe each of you say a little bit more about the role of religion, um, Catholicism and Protestantism, and to how important is religion? Is this theological, doctrinal in origin? At what point does it fade away? Um, and can there be blood libels without religion at all? Yeah, so these are hugely weighty questions. And so I'll just begin by saying that that Messina, New York was a, a typical small town, the kind of small town that, that existed everywhere in, in the United States. What made it different in the early 20th century was the opening of a gigantic Alcoa aluminum smelting plant. And it opened there because of the St. Lawrence River and uh, canals that were that were built to harness the hydroelectric power because you need a huge amount of energy to smelt aluminum into in, 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 into the material that can be fashioned into the products that that we know. And there is no way that this region could have produced a, a workforce to create this aluminum. And so the, the workers were imported. And so you, you had Alcoa people who went to Ellis Island and recruited people off, off the boat. And most of the people who were coming in in the early 20th century were from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe precisely the places where there had been a really depressingly widespread revival of the ritual murder accusation in the late 19th and early 20th century. This was true, by the way, also of Quebec. In Quebec City, there was a terrible ritual murder accusation in the, the, the early 19 teens. And so because the, the bulk of the workforce for the Alcoa plant came from Europe and from French-speaking Canada, it seemed to me a, a, a more than plausible idea that this was the vector that brought this European legend to the United States. Now, I mean, as you, you pointed out in your, your review of, of Magda's book and, and my book, Sarah, there's something a little strange because I'm, I, I can be seen to be agreeing with the, the, the xenophobes in Messina who, um, who were quick to blame foreigners for, for, for all of this. But the, 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 the reality is that in Messina in the, in the 19th century, like so many other towns, there was static between Jews and, and, and Gentiles, but, but nothing that would come close to the, the the degree of hatred that has to that, that that has to be behind a ritual murder accusation, and so that's why it seemed to me very likely that the the substance of this accusation came from the outside. Now, supported by a revival of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, there were four million members of the Klan in 1924 supported by Henry Ford, Henry Ford, who put out a weekly anti-Semitic newspaper, horrendous newspaper. And because it was a weekly, it's, it, 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 it really traveled around the country. Its circulation was double the circulation of the New York Times. And so media, this, this brings us back also to something that Maga said in one of your original questions, Sarah, media was, what was important in helping to explain the kind of conditions of possibility in the 1920s for the surfacing of this legend in upstate New York. Mm 
Yeah, and and I do just want to add, uh, since I have the opportunity to um, ask you this question directly, that um, I think it was in 1913, the most notorious of the 20th century um, murder accusation cases happened in Russia against Bayless, the, the infamous Bayless affair. And he, in fact, came to America, I believe, just a year before Barbara's disappearance, and it was covered by the newspapers. And I was wondering, since Magda, Magda's work shows us really the impact of um, print media, whether the combination of, of Ford's virulently anti-Semitic newspaper and renewed coverage of the Bayless affair because of the recent arrival of Bayless himself, even though he was exonerated. Uh, yeah. But And I think we can see that that innocence has absolutely nothing to do with the, the, the prosecution and the repetition of these accusations, um, whether that might not also be part of this story. So it's really important to, to take a look at the media environment yeah. of, the, of the early 20th century. It took two days at the fastest to get from New York City to Messina. Nobody read the New York Times. In okay, Messina. okay. No, right. no, nobody read national newspapers, and there were mm -hmm. a zillion local newspapers mm -hmm. that covered local news. There were sometimes associate, uh, you know, Associated Press stories, but the Bayless case did not get covered. You okay. wouldn't. Okay, read that's it. interesting. Yeah, you wouldn't have right. read it. So mm -hmm. it's just it, it's just not an issue. Henry Ford's paper, because it was weekly and because it didn't involve breaking news. There was no reason to read the New York Times. By the time it got to Messina, it would be three or four, the news would be three or four days old. A weekly, which didn't cover breaking news, you were more likely to read that in small town America. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, well, um, let, let me throw back the question to our um, early modern historians about the role of religion. I mean, how, not to put too fine a point on it, but how responsible is uh, the Catholic hierarchy um, for inventing and perpetuating this particular accusation? And why do we see blood libels happening in places where recreating the crucifixion of Jesus might not be such a natural kind of a nightmare? So uh, I think that's a good question and also because I think Christianity plays a, a key role and that might also clarify the description we've seen of this event that seems to be tying the, the myth of, uh, of the, uh, the libels against Jews to uh, antiquity. Yes, there is the story, the ancient story, but there is no direct link between that ancient second century BCE story and the accusations that we call blood libels uh, to, today. Um, that is a product of Christian environment. And that is, as, uh, as Sarah and Francois know, very much embedded in the uh, tropes, Christian tropes, uh, whether it's crucifixion, whether it's um, transubstantiation and the presence of blood in uh, the wafer, which Jews were thought to make matzah as a <laughs> replacement of the uh, the wafer. So the the Christian elements are there. Um, your question about um, about Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has a huge role in the original place. Um, the popes actually in the medieval period condemned these accusations, and that's an important thing that. That changes in the early modern period, um, which is why I argue that the blood libel is really an early modern story in that in that sense. Um, and the belief in the idea that Jews might kill Christian children is not uh, unique to Catholics. Uh, that is, we see it also in Protestant works and uh, including the, um, the works uh, of uh, Sebastian Münster, who was a Hebrew, who knew uh, Hebrew language, and yet he included these tales in his uh, magnificent Cosmographia. Um, but there was a, a difference in terms of belief uh, that it is... Um, he, that the, the children were, were holy martyrs, and that was a, a Catholic uh, 
part of a Catholic doctrine, believe in saints, believe in, you know, holy people. That is something that is not non-existent in, in uh, Protestantism. And the other thing that is important is that because if Sebastian Munster and, and um, Protestants were very much familiar with Hebrew books, they were not claiming that Jews may have killed Christians to obtain their blood to use in Jewish rituals. That story of killing, again, it, it aligned and, and Luther does it with the idea of cruelty, enmity, Jews as enemies of Christians, but not at the level of that use of blood. And that is something much more uh, common in areas where the the knowledge of Hebrew text and, and language were not, and that certainly was the, the case in Poland. The Catholic okay. Church, Church, I'll just uh, one more sentence. The Catholic Church, however, recognized a couple of stories, um, accusations, and recognized the um, the children, the purported victims of Jews, as Beati as as blessed. They were never canonized, I want to say, but Simon and Trent, the image that you saw in the ad for this event, uh, which is which comes from a printed chronicle, um, is a, a, a such an example. Uh, almost a hundred over a hundred years after the boy died, um, he was included in a liturgical calendar and the cult was recognized. And that has be, had a, a tremendous impact on the rooting of that trope and legitimizing subsequent accusations against Jews because that was a recognized um, cult. Thank you. And Francois, do you want to add anything about yes, the role of Catholic faith and Catholic authorities in uh, promoting absolutely. the bloodline? And, and I think Spain is a good example of the central role that the church can play in the kind of survival of these narratives. I've already mentioned the Inquisition, but in Spain you have the rise of two cults centering around two of these uh, alleged children. These, you know, that are supposedly take place in the Middle Ages, then these narratives survive in the early modern period, not just because they're repeated by polemics, but as Magda has pointed out, they enter authoritative sources. They, they're taken up by the Bollandists, a society who dedicated to you know, the promotion of saintly, of, of, of the veneration of saints. And in the 19th century, one of these cults, the cult of uh, little Dominic de Val in Taigosa, receives uh, a lot of support from the church because he becomes he, he's used as a role model for young Spanish Catholic children. He's supposedly a choir boy, martyred by Jews, etc. And therefore, he's presented as a role model of a virtuous Catholic child. And the cult received the support of none other in the early 20th century of Cardinal Marie del Val, who claims a relationship to the boy's family. Um, then in the 20th century, with the rise of Franco, you have this alliance between the state and the church. And the cult of Dominguito really becomes very mainstream. And one of the most common primary uh, illustrated history books for primary age school children in Spain has a chapter uh, entitled The Jews Kill a Christian Child uh, with horrific pictures. And that is a very common school book in schools right, un right up until 1962, until Vatican II. And the cults of, of little Saint Dominic de Val and uh, the Holy Child of La Guardia still exist today in Spain. Every year there are processions, uh, they're the object of veneration, they have sanctuaries. It, it might seem quite remarkable to us, uh, but this is not apparently not seen as controversial. Okay. Spain, although neither boy is canonized, I should add. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a natural segue. I only want to um, have, have the panelists discuss maybe for five more minutes because we have lots of questions. But in those five minutes, I mean, I think everybody's minds are on contemporary circumstances, on QAnon, on politicians um, using anti-Jewish dog whistles, on the Pittsburgh Tree of Life shooting, uh, which was linked to um, immigration and replacement theory. The, the synagogue was accused of 
working together with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Association to bring immigrants into America specifically to threaten um, white America and um, the uh, Magda can remind me was it the California shooter the who Poway, specifically yeah. referenced the Poway synagogue attack specifically referenced um, Simon of Trent and the ritual the, the child murder libel so um, to what extent um, has this simply become a political weapon for the Nazis for Franco for contemporary American politicians and if anybody knows about Europe you can address Europe as well. So I, I think um, it's it's important. I think takes us back to the uh, the, the media um, um, environment and also takes us back to the nineteenth century and, and late nineteenth century revival and this change of dynamic of, uh, of the of the uh, accusations. So in the early modern period, uh, this is a an elite issue. This is pushed by the elites. It is not the riffraff, that idea that it's uneducated riffraff that brings that idea up. That's an, an Enlightenment era myth that then is, of course, uh, changes its dynamic in the late 19th and early 20th century when that myth gets popularized, in fact. Um, but as, as Hillel Kieval in his recent book shows that the 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 ritual murder, and at that point they were called ritual murder. That's a, the the 19, late nineteenth and early twentieth century phrase. We're actually fueling anti-Semitism. He argues that it wasn't anti-Semitism fueling the accusations because these were against Jews in their hometowns, like their neighbors, and in, in the communities that they were very much embedded. But it was the other way around. The media environment. The noise in light of some of the rumors became amplified by the media and became translated into press into, by anti Semitic press at that time. And what we're seeing today is um, similar kind of what used to be in the deep dark web. Um, the QAnon stuff, not, a few years ago, nobody would even pay attention to it. It has been amplified by respectable media because it is reported about. It is, uh, you know, it, it becomes then part of a of a much broader general um, discourse. Um, so, so that those those tales, those stories, those rumors become even as they are reported, they then become kind of factualized. They become reified because now you can do an excerpt and say Washington Post and put a date on it and it becomes um, it becomes reified in such a way. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that reified is how academics um, say it's become a thing. It's just a thing now, unfortunately. Um, Ed or Francois, do you want to add about the politics of the blood libel or the child murder accusation? What, what do politicians gain by amplifying this? I mean, just to go back again to the late 19th century, this is when you get the first specifically anti-Semitic political parties, parties whose program was built on hatred of Jews. That's the way they mobilize people. And so these are the, the, the early populist parties. And so populism and anti-Semitism are very closely linked. And so the the American populists who emerged in the in the 1890s, they were horrendously anti-Semitic, and so we're in one of these eras. And of course, not just in the United States, but it is a dramatic development in this country, really different from what what we've seen in a long time. The surfacing of populism, which has for over a century been connected to anti-Semitism is a really worrisome development and and it's not a it's not a new development but it, it's a rare development which is now nurtured by the explosion of 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 online media and that's unprecedented francois yes i would just like to add i think it's also important to consider the links between uh the blood libel and 
other tropes that have emerged, for example, in Nazi Germany, I mean, you do have the blood libel used by some aspects of Nazi propaganda, famously in Der Sturmer, there's a special issue on the topic. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, it's interesting how the same images, the same the tropes come in, for example, anxieties that took place in, in Nazi Germany about kosher slaughter, for example. Yes. And uh, Der Giftpilz, another virulently anti-Semitic book for children, for example, didn't include, if I remember correctly, the, the blood libel, but included you know, kosher slaughter with kind of images that, as far as I'm concerned, really kind of sought to, were inspired from the kind of early modern printed images of Jews slaughtering children, but here you had Jews portrayed as barbarously slaughtering you know, defenseless animals. Yes, um, I, and go on, Magda. Can I just say um, that the, the Sturmer is the conduit and the Nazi propaganda is the conduit for the neo-Nazi and for the QAnon uh, mm. knowledge. That's how it, how it enters. But I also want to add something that what is really worrisome, and that is a product of modern times since the 19, late 19th century, early 20th century, is that these stories, these accusations or rumors have a tendency of, of being ex, uh, leading to exclusionary violence. And it could be violence, real violence, or it could be um, kind of psychological violence that leads to essentially people then moving and finding the, their hometowns, their places in, in inhabitable anymore. Um, the kind of uh, cultural bullying that emerges from that. This is not the case in the many of the early modern uh, stories. Um, just to give you an example, in a number of these po Polish towns where this this happened, including in one that I'm very familiar with, Sandomierz, where two trials took place, Jews continued to live and reestablish their relations with it. It was not, uh, even like in Spain, it was not the Jews. It was some, you know, there was the, the aura that maybe the Jews have some rituals, mm -hmm. but they were able to live and continue in their hometowns where they, where they were. This, in the modern times, this led to a, 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 a violence and exclusion and essentially a, a ruin of life. Again, Trent is another story, but Jews, the Jewish life ended in, in uh, 1470s. Uh, but in general, that's, I think, a huge difference that, that creates an exclusionary kind of uh, push Jews out of the sense of a community. Can I just say a word about, about violence? And throughout most of, of American history, despite the anti-Semitism and prejudice against Jews, uh, violence against Jews was extraordinarily rare. Very different from Europe, where, where in modern times, violence against Jews has unfortunately been really common. And this is another thing that's worrisome about our own time, is that we are seeing violence against Jewish communities. Yes, against synagogues, against kosher grocery stores, uh, against individuals who, and again, this is one of my particular interests, are visually identifiable as Jewish now in modern America. It's usually because they wear kippot, yarmulkes, or some other sign of orthodox observance. Um, th there is so much we could talk about, uh, but we do have some questions, and I would like to try to address at least some of them. And I'm going to take the privilege of at least beginning to answer the first question or one of the first questions in our list, um, because I think the Middle Ages, my own particular field of study, are instructive in this. So one of the questions is, are there any historical instances when religious or governmental authorities publicly condemned accusations of the blood libel or the child murder charge? And the answer is absolutely yes. And I would venture to say that um, trial balloons floated with one of these charges were much more frequently popped or floated into space without any after effect than they did damage, which is not, of course, to downplay the damage they did do. But the very first ever child murder charge happened in 12th century England. Um, and in this case, as opposed to the case Francois mentioned, and as opposed to the case in Messina that Ed studies, there was a dead child, not just a dead child, but a child who died by violence. Um, a body was found in the woods, badly mauled, whether it was um, human violence or animal violence, nobody, I mean, is, is able to tell anymore. 
Um, that child was found, that child was buried. Um, nothing happened for a couple of years when a monk in the local monastery decided for um, reasons that were probably pretty self-serving and cynical, he wanted to make his monastery a pilgrimage site to try to puff up this child as a martyr. And the only way a dead child can really be martyred is if he died for his faith. And the only way a Christian child in overwhelmingly Christian England was going to die for his faith is if a non-Christian killed him. And the only non-Christians in 12th century England in Norwich, this town, were Jews. And that seems to have been kind of the thought process whereby this accusation was cooked up. And this monk wrote an entire book about it, listing and imagining this ritual crucifixion of the child with with cruel tortures, mimicking those of Christ, um, and in, inventing miracles that happened at the tomb of this child. Um, and it, nobody was ever prosecuted for it. The, the royal sheriffs in the town said that we don't believe a word of it. And Jews were never punished for this. There was no expulsion. There was no trial. So this was a totally failed attempt at um, accusing the Jews. Can I just chime in? Um, <laughs> That you, you received in, um, a, a link to uh, the website that's attached to the book behind me, uh, thebloodlibeltrail.org, and there are maps there. And the maps you can see, um, because it's such a complicated story, um, I did separate what, what the outcome may have been in the either stories or the, the actual trials that have taken place. And it's surprising because we tend to think about it that Jews were always persecuted and prosecuted for that. But the, in the majority, actually, of those 100 plus um, uh, cases that I have do uh, documented uh, that appear in the archives or chronicles that I've worked on, um, the majority of them Jews actually were not killed, not there was there were no consequences in, in that, such a way. They may have been trial, they may have suffered in other ways. So yes, and there were official, um, whether papal, uh, until 1540, papal uh, condemnations, royal condemnations, imperial condemnations, local authorities, um, right? So, so as, as Francois said at the very beginning, the majority of the cases did not have this sort of um, prosecutor. There had to be a reason, and that usually was political reason to push it, whether it is to establish a shrine, whether it is to have some political office or some other aspect or to exclude Jews from trades or some other reason. But there had to be a reason, not every child. And there were a lot of dead children that were found, especially in the spring. Um, and I say, especially in Northern Europe, when things melt, um, that but not all dead children end up with accused Jews. Um, yeah, and, and, and I, would, I would add as well, um, we, we've really been talking about the accusations and the accusers. We haven't given much space to the accused, even though we're all historians of Jewish history, among other things. Um, Jews were generally not passive in the face of these. Ed, maybe you can talk about how the Jewish community of Messina jumped into action to fight back. Yeah, they, and, and they, they really did. And they brought in major reinforcements from, from New York City. And so as soon as this accusation surfaced, the president of, uh, of, of the congregation, Messina, got in, got in touch with Rabbi Stephen Wise, who was president of the American Jewish Congress, and Louis Marshall, who was president of the, uh, the American Jewish Committee. And both of these major towering figures in American Jewish life got involved in this case and got involved in, in, in ways that are, are really important and show Going back to what you said a couple of minutes ago, Sarah, how important what elites and leaders do is in these circumstances. And Rabbi Wise was very close to Governor Al Smith, contacted him immediately, and Al Smith put out a statement strongly condemning this this accusation and disciplining some state a state a police official who was who was involved in this. And so I, I saw a, a brief question about whether the Jews ever, got, uh, Messina ever got an apology. And so both Ma Wise and, and Marshall did really insist on getting an apology, which they eventually did. Yeah, and thank you. And, and then I the just wanted to period too, right? Jews jumped into action immediately. 
and martial support from Christians and from their own within their own communities. Um, so yes, definitely. Um, and very and, much and I, I will just add that when I teach this kind of history to my students, I always tell them if there's leadership. one takeaway you remember, it's that leadership matters. It matters. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we're all working and writing. None of us will ever take heart and irrationality mm -hmm. away from the human race, but it can absolutely be tamped down and contained with the right leadership. And, and, and leadership matters not only in reaction, but also in pursuing of it and preventing it uh, or informing people, right? We, the Kishinev pogrom, not necessarily directly related to blood libel, although there is a motif there too, what became known and the reaction ensued because individuals acted and, and, and i will say the congress is a, do, the, the wrong leaders can sustain and amplify that's, that's cool. yeah and this is one of the reasons why media newspapers today i mean literally today are pressing people in positions of power to condemn various expressions of anti-semitism because it makes a difference uh let me go on we have four minutes left and there's just such an important question here i don't want to miss um, which is basically asking the panelists to discuss the links between the blood libel myth and the other kind of conspiracy theories and anti-Jewish tropes about Jewish dom dominance, control of the media, finance, greed, other areas. What are the links between this kind of very specific fantasy and these more general forms of anti-Semitic um, rhetoric? Francois, I think you can. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> on one level, there's there's a link in that you often find the tropes together. Again, to refer to the case of the Holy Child of La Guardia, you not only have you know, the conspiracy that the Jews murder Christian children, but the accusation also includes that they've um, stolen a consecrated host. So another big medieval uh, conspiracy theory, and that they're going to produce this um, magical potion to kill all Christians with it. And later on in the, in, in the 20th century, for example, it's interesting that whenever there's criticism of the cults of these quote unquote saintly children in Spain, very often the, um, the pushback is, well, of course they would say that. That's what the quote unquote Jewish media would say. Um, it's kind of, you know, conspiracy theories are circular lines of mm -hmm. reasoning. So um, the yeah, circle I has no beginning or end. Yeah, I think the trope of Jewish power stems, stems from a, a larger question of uh, perception of Jews and position of Jews within Christianity. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be humbled and servants to Christian, and when they were not, and especially um, more affluent Jews, and they were in the pre-modern period the ones that were targeted as uh, subjects of these accusations, community leaders, it was a sort of a disciplining uh, effect. Mm -hmm. And that trope of then um, Jewish power. And I mean, the newspapers, that's the modern era, that's, that's uh, Ed's uh, specialty here. Um, but that is, uh, is related then to this, uh, you know, the position of Jews within society and the visibility of Jews mm -hmm. going back to that, to that, not necessarily because of their physical visibility, but their prominence in, in society that leads to these tropes of Jewish power and control, because they're not supposed to be in those positions right. of yeah position. and and i i would love to jump in and just elaborate on that a little bit um you know it, i think there is a lot of um kind of muddying of the waters when we talk about contemporary american anti-semitism uh because although jews are are less than three percent of the population jews do have disproportionate prominence in certain fields which is equated with disproportionate power, um, but that is no explanation for anti-Semitism or any of these anti-Semitic tropes because they come up just as frequently or more frequently in places where the imputation of power to Jews is beyond ludicrous. Um, 12th century England, it's ludicrous to say that Jews had um, power uh, where they were a tiny, 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 quite, um, you know, powerless minority and in other places these pop up where there are not even Jews. Um, so I would like to add the dimension I wanted to add is it's not uh, these kind of conspiracy theories are not 
a reaction to Jewish power as a projection of a sense of non-Jewish powerlessness. And it is, it's, it's all circular because the sense of powerlessness is um, inevitably ludicrous because it is in fact the majority culture that tends to be perpetuating these accusations. But it's a, a reaction to a sense of loss of hegemony or dominance or a birthright superiority or a birthright unquestioned exercise of power. Um, that then makes them see some horrible, hidden, secret corruption that is, uh, you know, overturning what should be the natural order. So whether Jews have any kind of money or power, whether Jews have any kind of money in it or influence is absolutely unrelated to the um, birth and spread of these accusations. It's a sense of inadequate total dominance among populations that think they ought to be all powerful. And, and this really relates to populism currently because populism has a veneer of anti-capitalism or, or at least hostility to the corporate exploiters of the, of, of the people. But to really be anti-capitalist would, would be dangerous. And so to, to divert that on to Jews, Jews are the, are, are, are the ones who are, who are exploiting the people hidden a, a, as, as they are. And so, I, I, and this is a theme that we've seen in populism over the last century and a half or so. And that is one of the more worrisome things that, that has developed in our, in our own time is that, that populism and its connection to Jews as the capitalist exploiters, that's a problem. And I, and I would also, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, it's, it's the now, nowadays the term in favor in that kind of narrative seems to be globalists. Right, 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 right. Which is another term for, you know, international capitalists or something that you saw in the 1920s and 30s. Mm. And I would also add that one of the dangerous thing now is that many of those um, populist themes without mentioning Jews are based on old anti-Semitic tropes. Mm -hmm. And it it's one or two Google searches away from getting onto the anti-Semitic trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, an another thing that I, I do like to emphasize when I have this kind of conversation is that a lot of people say, well, I mean, but globalist, that's just a word and there is globalization. And, you know, how, how can you say that this is anti-Semitic? And I will say that the two groups of people who are the most deeply familiar with anti-Semitic tropes, visual tropes and rhetorical verbal tropes, are scholars of anti-Semitism and anti-Semites. So we know it when we see it and we hear it because we know what anti-Semites mm -hmm. traffic in. Um, it's not our imagination. We're not imposing it. We do not scream every time somebody writes on a course evaluation, oh, my global history course was boring. We don't say this is anti-Semitic, but when somebody says um, my political position was defeated because of a globalist conspiracy, we know what we're hearing. And you know the other catchwords when people rail against um, a billionaire Soros, who happens to be Jewish, and the same people embrace other billionaires or alleged billionaires who happen not to be Jewish, I think we know what we're hearing. Um, when people say that banks suck your blood dry, uh, we know what we are hearing because we know what anti-Semites are saying to each other. And um, that is why we talk about dog whistles. This is a way of communicating with people who are listening on the same wavelength as the people who are speaking. Okay, it is 8.04. Uh, we haven't exhausted all of the questions, but I think we have exhausted most of them. So I am going to thank our panelists very much. I am going to recommend to all of our guests that they read the books of Magdes Heder of <laughs> Ed of Francois, they are all wonderful, they are all readable, um, and they all have a lot to teach us beyond what we've said tonight. So thank you all. <laughs>